Okay, hi everybody and welcome to the latest episode of Second Features. Today we are talking about the film most commonly known as Turkish Star Wars. Um, the, the full title I'm not going to try and pronounce in Turkish because it'll be horrible. That's a good idea. But it's, it's the, the man... I'll let you have a go. If no, you no, 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 no. The man who saved the world is, the, the, is what it's known as. Um, and our guest later on in the show is Ian Robert Smith, who is, he's the man who saved this film, kind of, if you like. That's nice. Uh, he's, been to- he's been touring it around the UK. He's helped oversee a 2K restoration. Uh, he's written extensively on remakes. And um, yeah, there's nothing he doesn't know, I think. So yeah, anyway, looking forward that's to hearing be, from Ian later gonna on. Be very interesting. Um, before we talk about the movie, perhaps we should just give a brief plug of uh, what we've been up to since the last episode. Oh, yeah, good which idea. Which was that we recorded a commentary track for uh, a Joan Collins movie, something I never thought I would say. No, one of her more time. well-known movies, to be fair. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet. Not but yet, going to, but it's going to go it's global. It's going to become, oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so do you want to tell us about that or tell the listeners about that movie? Uh, yeah, well, we, it's, we um, recorded the uh, commentary track as hosts of the Second Features podcast for um, Network On Air's release of The Monster. Uh, which is also titled originally... Actually, it has seven titles. You can hear more if you mm. listen to our commentary. Um, yes. But another of the original titles was I Don't Want to Be Born, and it stars Joan Collins in uh, a film role, uh, in a leading role. Um, and it's um, yeah, it's a horror film, a kind of exorcist slash um, uh, Rosemary's Baby style um, kind of hom- homage or ripoff. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> which well, which actually, word yeah, you want to use but um appro- appropriate for the topic of this yeah. week's uh, episode yeah and don't go forget of course ralph bates playing it's a me a mario uh with his brilliant italian accent yes oh, yes okay. playing an italian Absolutely. character with the most ridiculous <laughs> comic accent you have ever heard <laughs> Um, you couldn't make it up. Uh, so that That's is that is coming funny. out. When is that coming out? October. Um, yeah, sometime in October. Yeah. They're doing it. They've got a couple of Halloween releases, so that's one of them. Um, and I also wrote the booklet for that, and the Dark Eyes of London, which is their other Halloween release. So that's a. If you get both of those, I've got booklets in both. I apologise <laughs> um, for that. But the main purpose for buying them, obviously apart from hearing Ralph Bates' accent, is for our commentary. Our podcast the, commentary. Podcast yeah. commentary. So, so that's fun. Yeah. Maybe there will be more in the future. I hope so. Who can say? But so, Turkish Star Wars. Laura, before we uh, before we discuss doing this film for the podcast, was it something that you were aware of? Had you come across this before? I'd, I'd kind of peripherally heard of the idea of Turkish remakes and rip-offs of things. Um, I'd never heard of the film. Uh, so it was, yeah, kind of an interesting concept. Uh, mm. And I didn't really know anything about Turkey or the film industry or the kind of context in which these kinds of films are made. So it's been really interesting for me to read up on that stuff um, and to learn about this. I will say, Adrian, I found it incredibly painful uh, watching the actual film, The Man Who Saves the World, um, which, uh, yeah, 1982 film, which is also known as Turkish Star Wars. Um, but it isn't actually, uh, the plot is not Star Wars, but it does use, blatantly use a lot of footage and music from Star Wars mm. and other Hollywood films. Um, but I, I mean, maybe it's just the copy I watched on the internet. Just, I'm not sure how it was meant to look originally. <laughs> <laughs> but it was um I, I i found it quite confusing uh i found that i could only take it in small doses <laughs> yeah well it turns out so there's a there's a very good documentary by a filmmaker called ed glazer who has been response one of the people who helped find this restored print that um ian can tell us more about but he made a there's about an eight minute documentary he made on youtube which is worth watching. I'll put a link in the show notes. But he said in there that the originally the, the film was about two and a half hours long. Two so, and a half hours long? Yeah. So rather than split it into two films, which was one suggestion, they just cut an hour out. So what the- you say that it's... 
you said it's confusing. One of the reasons is because there's about an hour of plot missing. Well, that adds a lot of necessary context. <laughs> mm. And I'm assuming that's gone forever because they've only now just recently found a 35 millimeter print. I think the negatives are long gone. So whatever hour of footage is missing that would have helped. I mean, maybe it was just an, um, another hour of things being quite painful, but perhaps it would have helped understand what the hell's going on. Um, well, uh, well, we'll never know. Do you find it confusing? Like, can you can you tell me what the plot is? Because I know there's a wizard, and I know yes. there's a war. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so there's a fight between the good guys and the bad guys, and this the film starts with this fight in space. Um, and what I liked was so this is where we get Star Wars footage, but brilliantly what they've done is the bad guys in star war it, it's all the footage mainly from the end scene the attack on the death star but what they've done is they've used the footage of the bad guys but made them the good guys so um like the the heroes of our movie are the ones flying the tie fighters and they're shooting the bad guys who are flying the x-wings so they've kind of interestingly reversed who's good well, and who's see, bad that, in Star Wars that is why it partly like it makes it quite confusing and also yeah. like I watched it in Turkish yeah. <laughs> so, so, so yeah. but I mean the, the, so, the fact that I don't know why I don't know why they're fighting well, that bit I didn't quite get other than there's some kind of struggle between a guy who's wearing this weird helmet covered in spikes um, and they're shooting two of Turk. Uh, what's interesting is that they they're very specifically Turkish. The the subtitles talk about the two heroes being Turkish spacemen or whatever they are. Um, even though the Earth, so they talk about how there was this war, then the Earth was exploded into smaller rocks that are floating around in space. So there are communities of people from Earth dotted around on these little bits of rock i think okay so that's kind of what's going on and then uh we've got our two heroes in a spaceship that get shot down and they crash on a planet and they basically crash into this mountain range in turkey that i first i recognize straight away as being the same location that is used in the film you're the hunter from the future i don't know if you're if you've ever come across your no. that's um that's an Italian, it was an Italian TV series, there's four episodes, that was edited down into one 90-minute movie for the American audiences. It's a very popular film in America, because it was on TV all the time. Um, and it's kind of like this caveman who has these adventures uh, in the same mountain range that we're in here. So anyway, <laughs> they looked quite familiar. But yeah, so they get shot down. And then they land with this sort of primitive civilization that are surrounded by uh, pyramids. I'm sure I saw the Sphinx in there as well. <laughs> so it looks like they've landed in Turkey or something. Uh, in, they've landed in Egypt or something. Um, and they get captured by the locals. Was that right? They get these guys who are on horses, have a fight with them. And then there are some other guys that look like robots. <laughs> I mean, it's a very um, interesting uh, film. There's uh, a guy who's dressed as Robbie the Robot from Lost in Space, I think, or Forbidden Planet. And how many... I don't know. What? I'm how many films already. did you um, spot footage from in well, this Well, there's, there's definitely Star Wars. The Star Wars footage is only really the beginning and the ending because um, they, they battle in space and then... At the end of the film, they go back into space and have another battle. And I think there might be a couple of shots of some aliens from Star Wars. I think there's some footage from the cantina scene in Star Wars. I sound like such a Star Wars nerd right now. Um, no, not but, really. Uh, but like Star Wars also... nerds. I've met Star Wars nerds and yeah, they'd be like, true. this is from minute so-and-so of, yeah, of you know, A New Hope. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. It's not yeah. But there's... There's also definitely footage in there from, I think it's Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a bit when they talk about the history of the Earth struggle or something. And we see footage from Sword and Sandal movies. Um, and there's rocket footage, like stock footage for rocket launches. Oh, yeah, there's NASA footage yeah. um, in there And there are well. costumes. There are costumes of people that look like they've walked in from Mad Max, um, as well as Battlestar Galactica kind of costumes. 
yeah, you said there's a wizard who's got these amazing spikes around his head that, I mean, is not very practical. And he's got a wife who is the queen of the planet who tries to <laughs> seduce one of our heroes. Um, they have to fight with some mummies. If you have, you had like two young kids oh, yeah. making up the plot of a story using Lego, um, hmm. just kind of playing in their room. You couldn't come up with something as bizarre no. as this. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a it's... mummy, and there's a man with spikes, and there's a wizard, and then there's a war. I mean, they initially, I think, they initially get taken prisoner by the the locals, but then they, one of the local women falls in love with one of them or something, and they. They like become the heroes and they're going to fight back. So the man who saves the world is basically the hero of the movie. He's going to save this community who live in this rock from the guy with the spiky head. But there's a brilliant, <laughs> the, one of the most famous kind of viral clips from the movie is the train, the training sequence. What did you think of his, um, the bit where they're training in the mountains? They're punching rocks. Do you remember that bit? That's like, that's quite a fun when in it because i did i had i, I kind of watched bits of the film oh. i watched as much as i could take and kind of at dipped some in point, and out so that's partly oh, why okay. i'm so confused adrian <laughs> yeah that wouldn't help at some point in the middle it's like an hour and 30 sequence. minutes yeah i know i know there's yeah, talk um, us through it so he, talk us through the training sequence well so the training sequence he's punching rocks to toughen up his hands um in a kind of ninja style or something and there's this there are two guys two heroes one of them's punching rocks the other one is tying rocks to himself uh, and dragging them along they're like making themselves super tough there's a brilliant bit where where um where arkin who's the main hero he ties one rock to each leg and then he's jumping along to strengthen himself up because later in the film he's going to defy gravity because apparently he's training his legs to be so strong that he can leap like 20 30 feet in the air um yeah so it's pretty funny it's uh, uh, i mean I'm, 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 comes... i think your description might be more entertaining than like those yeah. sequences i mean it's basically it is lots of fighting so they once they've done the training sequence the rest of the movie is effectively punching the heads off puppets <laughs> uh there's just like this big bar fight it's like the cantina scene i think deliberately so in star wars but the puppets there's these weird did you see the sort of weird orange furry guys with claws did you see this i don't know oh you've got to you've got to find that bit at least it's really funny <laughs> there are these big orange furry puppets that look like giant elmos oh and god he's punching the heads off them one of them he punches the whole he punches the whole thing in half um it's brilliant. So there's like just lots of fighting. He he rips the arm off one and then beats it to death with its own arm, <laughs> uh, which is particularly amusing. It, it's just yeah, none of it makes any sense. Then there's a whole sequence where we discover that this community used to be Islam. He finds a church where he gets taken, and we get this whole backstory about the importance of Islam See, to their history. That's, that is quite culture. serious. Like, yeah, uh, in the context of this quite silly, um, yeah, kind of madcap, uh, you know, patchwork of of things. <laughs> yeah, it's like all of a sudden it gets like we suddenly realise we shouldn't have. I don't know. Yeah, suddenly we've got to take it very seriously, and uh, he gets taken through this sort of underground temple, and he's given a massive sh uh, gold sword which he can then use to fight the bad guys. But at some point, so it's really weird, so he's taking on the wizard, um, but then the sword turns into gold gloves for him to punch people really hard with. So I don't know. I didn't quite understand. And then they go back into space, I think, and there's so, more Star Wars footage. And then he flies away in the Millennium Falcon. Um. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the ship that looks a lot like the Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you've wanted to kind of do this uh, film or, you know, the subject for um, mm. a while. So what drew you to Turkish Star Wars? Did you watch it for oh. the podcast or had you seen it? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd never seen this before, but I've been interested in, in uh, Ian's research for a long time. I saw him do a paper at Cine Excess about 10 years ago. Uh -huh. Um, which was about Bollywood remakes and ripoffs, 
And so I, that was when I first became aware that there was such a thing. And I, so I've really just, I've read Ian's stuff before when I saw his book and, um, and I saw him a couple of years ago when I didn't manage to get to any of his screenings. He did a series of screenings around the country with Turkish Star Wars and I didn't, I missed them all for some reason. But anyway, so that was why I suggested it. It's mainly to, to get to talk to Ian. It's not because I think this is a masterpiece, but... I would be is, quite worried for you. Yeah, though. it is very entertaining. And I, but I think particularly there's a really good documentary that... So, so I went to a, a Zoom talk that Ian did a couple of months ago about Turkish cinema. It was really interesting. And um, everybody who attended the talk was sent a link by this Turkish filmmaker who made this documentary called uh, Remake, Remix, Ripoff. I think I'm getting that right. Uh, so I had a look at that as well. And that's what it's just oh. really interesting to to learn about how much hard work went into it's making so, I mean, they're so fascinating and the sort of industrial yeah. model of these films in sort of Turkish cinema. So the fact that, they, you know, these companies were making hundreds of films a year, um, that there yeah. are actors in Turkey who who have like up to a thousand films on their uh, you know mm -hmm. CVs um, oh, it's amazing. and kind of and the idea of sort of remakes and ripoffs which of course I'm kind of more used to in the context of fan culture and fan made yeah. productions and fan parodies not in terms of like an actual organized industry so I mean it's really really interesting um, and yeah. I've been I've really been enjoying kind of reading about it. Unfortunately, this is the first film on our podcast I haven't been able to get through because it's too <laughs> painful to watch. I'm sorry, but I just I, I challenge our listeners to watch this yeah. on the internet. You can get it. On, it's on YouTube. Watch it from start YouTube, yeah. to finish without watch a break. I challenge you. <laughs> with the, with the, yeah, watch the version with the subtitles on YouTube. Yes, watch, I would I would encourage you to watch the version with the subtitles. Yeah, yeah you might get very lost. But I, I think we, we this isn't the first first film we've done where the talking about it and what you know around it is more interesting than actually watching <laughs> it um and i'm sure it probably won't be the last hopefully it's the last film that you couldn't manage to get all the way through i, I mean hopefully the first and sad. last it's i mean yeah. it is interesting to be i mean it's like mm. it's just nutty it's like i've described it as like you know looking into a very bright light um, and mm -hmm. fearing that your retinas might detach if you look too long. That's how I felt when I watched <laughs> this. I was like, there's just so much. There's just so much. Yeah. Like, I don't really understand yeah. any of it. <laughs> there's a well, lot. There's yeah. a lot that's happening. That's that's fair. But it's interesting you mentioned that, I mean, about the sort of fan films. And one thing I was thinking when I was watching this is that I think this is something that students could really benefit from. If you're just starting out and making your own sort of short student films, I mean, when I was doing that at college, I would have loved to have seen this film because it's kind of inspiring. It shows if you if you forget about copyright, if you don't care about copyright, you can just take some elements of somebody else's film and remix it, use it as your own and put yourself into the movie. Like this, not only does it use Star Wars footage, but it's using music, particularly the, the Indiana Jones theme comes up all the time and it uses the Flash Gordon Queen music and um, various other things. I know um, in a lot of Turkish cinema, particularly gangster films and crime films, they use the Godfather theme all the time. I, I just think when I was at college, we were constantly being told you can't use copyright stuff. You can't use copyright stuff. And, you know, that was it. So we'd, we would have to I mean, constantly, I would... make, which is fair. That is fair. I, yeah, it's I true. mean, I would, I would, I would stay away from inspiring students to nick stuff. But, from but other I just think, films. For, purely from a kind of just purely creative point of view, like if you just forget about copyright and you forget all that, and we we live in a remix age, right? I mean, music does this all the time. Music mm -hmm. samples thing, you know, sampling has been around for decades now in um, music. But what's exciting, I think, here is that there is a film industry that is sampling. It's remixing and, and, and sampling and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I kind of get, I get what you mean in terms of creativity. Yeah. So what if you took away all barriers and you yeah. could just, you know, remix and collage all of like film yeah. culture to your heart's content? What would you come up with? So, yeah, um, yeah it is kind of. So I think it's quite fun from from that point of view. Although, of course, the problem would be then you couldn't do anything with it apart from show it at a festival, but nobody could actually buy it. 
I suppose, <laughs> which is why they were always telling us not to do that. But, um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I think there's a lot, the film has a lot to offer, even if the experience of watching it is occasionally quite painful. Occasionally. But, but stick with it, stick with it for the training montage and the bar fight if you where could, he's uh, just p- if, punching the heads off everything. In the show notes, funny. if we could put highlights from specific yeah. scenes. <laughs> I will. I'll, <laughs> I'll link. Yeah, I'll link to those bits. It's really weird. Um, but anyway, it's probably a good point to uh, to stick some of the. Uh, I'll stick a bit of music in here, and uh, it'll be the Indiana Jones theme inevitably. And uh, then let's let's have a chat with Ian, who I'm sure can can tell us a bit more about why we should be watching this film. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'd like to welcome into the podcast, we've got Ian Robert-Smith, who is a senior lecturer in film at King's College London, and he specialises in global popular cinemas with an emphasis on the ways in which material is adapted and reworked across national contexts. Hello, Ian, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Ian. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Laura. Yeah, no, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I nearly said welcome to the show. That sounds so awful. I'm glad I stopped myself in time. <laughs> Um, so you you had a book out a few years ago about remakes. Was that specifically Turkish remakes, or was there some Bollywood in there as well? I because I know you've you've covered a few different national cinemas in your research. Yeah, so my book, uh, the Hollywood meme. It was yeah, it's a kind of global um, comparison of of these kinds of international reworkings and remakes. So yeah, it has a chapter on Turkey and, and all of the kind of Yeshil Cham Turkish remakes of the seventies and eighties. Uh, but then it's also got uh, the Philippines, films like uh, James Batman, where mm. James Bond and Batman team up to fight crime. And, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I know there's f- some fantastic ones in there. In fact, yeah, there's a Batman musical as well with old 50s rock and roll songs. And uh, Things you must have seen, Ian. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I mean, it's it was such a... Because that was my PhD, and it was such a kind of joy to research, just kind of tracking down... Uh, all of these films which are yeah they're all breaking copyright laws or often not getting much international distribution Mm -hmm. Uh, like they're not fan films though they're like proper films yeah yeah so that was one of my rules is that I didn't want to have anything that was a fan film it all had to be films that were released cinematically um that are proper feature films um but yeah so I had Turkey had the Philippines and then Bollywood as well and was kind of comparing those but also yeah I mentioned examples from uh, Indonesia, there's the uh, the Lady Terminator, or at least yeah. that was its yeah. release when it played in, in Grindhouse in the US. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. Is that the one with the tagline, um, first she mates, then she terminates? That's Something the one. Like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it kind of mixes uh, the kind of local legend of the South Seas Queen. So like the, mm. the title of the film in Indonesia is The Revenge of the South Seas Queen. But then when it plays internationally, it's Lady Terminator because they've taken wow. that local legend and then just added in the plot of the Terminator, you yeah. know, switch the gender, but it follows the, the rest of the story pretty closely. I, mean, I have to say, this is making some of the films I study sound downright classy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, no, it is a problem. I, I, I think of, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever written about a, a classy film. <laughs> well... <laughs> Who's to say what is classy and what? Well, isn't? I mean, you're in good company. Uh, yeah. We're all, we're all kind of, uh, we're all of that bent, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, what's the, what's the, just out of curiosity, what is the nuttiest thing you've ever seen, or the oh. weirdest combination of stolen copyright material? I mean, there's one. There's uh, Uchtev Adam, which was one of the Turkish ones, and in fact, we've just tracked down a 35 millimeter print of that one. So we're hoping that at some point we can restore it and scan it and screen it but yeah it's um yeah Captain America teaming up with um uh Santo so the wrestler from Mexican cinema uh to battle Spider-Man who's running a smuggling operation through Istanbul and um yeah it's just it's just such a wonderful 
combination of characters and contexts. So yeah, I think that's probably, that's one of my favorites. And yeah, I'm really excited that we might actually get to show it to more people. Cause right now, yeah, there's a, there's an old DVD release um, of a fair, it's like a transfer of an old VHS. It's it's not great quality. So we're hoping mm. to do a proper restoration of that. And the, cool. um, the Captain America in that film, he's in the Turkish Star Wars film, isn't it? It's the same guy. Yeah, yeah, the same actor, yeah, who's the kind of, yeah, second lead in, in yeah. Turkish Star Wars, and yeah. Now, before we, I'm really interested in just something you said there, before we get into Turkish Star Wars itself, you mentioned they're tracking down a 35 millimeter print, and I'm interested in you, in the level of detective work that you have been involved in over the years with some of these films, and I know you've, you've been involved in helping rescue some of these films. On How do you go about tracking down 35 millimeter prints of Turkish movies? What's your process there? Um, it's often through contacts. So often there's a kind of, I guess it's a relatively small world of people who are like really into these films. Like lots mm -hmm. of people will have heard of, oh, there's a Turkish Star Wars and they'll have seen, you know, a YouTube video or a, you know, a quick, you know, an article online. But um, in terms of the people who are really kind of obsessed with this world, it becomes a fairly small world and then you kind of hear like oh someone has has found this and someone's managed to track down this so yeah ed glazer had found um yeah the last remaining 35 millimeter print of turkish star wars mm. um and he'd got in touch with me because he was he was struggling to find out a way of releasing it or of finding any way of screening it partly because of all the copyright problems mm. like he, he didn't want to be a distributor himself so he was contacting all of these different Blu-ray labels and distributors saying, I found the holy grail of remake exploitation. <laughs> this is the film we've all been looking for. We've all seen crappy ninth generation dubs of a VHS that's been transferred to YouTube and just looks horrible. Um, we now have a, an intact 35 millimeter print. Let's screen it. And they all say, we'd love to see it. Yeah. We're not so keen on like getting <laughs> sued by Disney um, for all of the the footage, the the music, you know, everything mm. in the film. And um, the, you say that he found the print. Isn't the story that there was a projectionist from Turkey who had kept it uh, rather than sending it back to the distributor, and he'd had it for years and then put it up for sale? Is that is that something? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, and that's often the way that these things kind of come about is that someone's stored them in a cupboard somewhere and didn't mm. realize that anyone was looking for it. Uh, and then eventually, yeah, you get, um, and, and a part, partly the issue is, yeah, who is going to release it? How are they going to get any money back from it? So I was oh, able yeah. to get some money from my university to pay for the, the, the digital scan of the film. Mm. Uh, and then we just, we did lots of screenings, always getting the rights from the Turkish rights holder. So like we were covered in terms of, doing professional film screenings like we you know we're not just screening a film without getting the rights mm. whether the turkish rights holder holds the rights to the footage <laughs> and the music that's used in the film is perhaps mm. uh, more debatable but uh but yeah i mean we're, we're yeah we're doing our best to try and get these films out there that's really fun so you said you mentioned screenings where might we be able to see future screenings is that something you've got planned when when things get back to norm, more normal. Yeah, so so when we first did the Turkish Star Wars restoration, we did a, a tour of the UK. And so, yeah, it played in Glasgow and Edinburgh and uh, Bristol and London and, um, yeah, Halifax, Leicester, yeah, all, all over. Wow. Um, and then, yeah, we've been planning a, a festival of these films. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic hit it and we had to postpone but right now we're looking at next April at the Cinema Museum in London. Oh, cool. So we've not properly announced it yet, but that, that's the plan. And it'll, mm. the plan is it will have a full, fe um, you know, two days weekend festival with six films. So the, the remakes of, yeah, Turkish Star Wars, Turkish Exorcist, Turkish <laughs> Star Trek, Turkish Some Like It Hot, Turkish Death Wish, then Jem Kaya's documentary, um about the whole phenomenon of, mm -hmm. of remake exploitation uh, and then guests so we're going to try and bring in jem kaya over bring ed glazer over from the us wow. bring loads of turkish academics over 
to kind of give introductions and do Q and A's and just give a bit of context. Uh, so yeah, Cinema Museum next next April is, is going to be the one. Oh man, that sounds amazing! I will definitely be there. <laughs> so I suppose we should let's go back to the beginning. You said that you did uh, your PhD was in this area. What led you? I know this is a sometimes a difficult question to answer, but why remakes? Like, where did this come from for you? What led you to this point where you've become a leading expert in this in this field? I mean, I guess I mean it's I've always been interested in kind of different versions of the same material. So I've always loved cover versions of songs. I've always been really interested in people doing different takes of. Of, of a classic song uh, and I used to yeah I would fill my kind of you know iPod with loads of different international you know cover versions of, of pop songs um, and then yeah I think I came across the Turkish Star Trek and the Turkish Exorcist actually through people that deal in the, the slightly kind of illegitimate copy of a copy, you mm -hmm. know, bootleg market um, that I think had been flourishing around video nasties in the UK and then various, you know, kind of expanded from there. Um, and yeah, they happened to to have, uh, without subtitles, just, you know, yeah, here's here's Turkish Star Trek. Um, and I was like, oh, that that sounds interesting. I'll, I'll have give a watch to that. And I thought, yeah, this, I'm, I'm really curious to see what this is like. I ended up writing a little bit about it um, during my degree and then that just kind of led me to kind of go further and further down that that hole just kind of trying to track down material um, so yeah I've always been fascinated by the kind of variations and remakes and adaptations and reworkings and that that's always been something that's really kind of caught my my attention uh, and it was just a case of trying to work out well what could I do as a scholar you know, at not in Nottingham at the time, mm. um, who is not fluent in you know twenty languages, um, and yet is trying to study this kind of global phenomenon. Um, so it then became yeah a kind of a kind of comparative project, because it, yeah there are Turkish academics and they'll be bringing them over um, to London for that event in April, who have written on these films. So I'm never going to be able to do that that kind of detailed archival cultural work to explain mm. the history of Turkish cinema in the 1970s and put these films into that context but I can put those into dialogue with the films that are going on and being made in Mexico and Indonesia and in the Philippines and in India and in Pakistan and in Italy and in Brazil and you know all of the countries all around the world pretty much every every industry that had a kind of flourishing popular industry at some point um, was doing reworkings of of Hollywood films, um, yeah. and so yeah, it was that it was that kind of comparative side that I felt actually I can, I can I can say something on that. Mm. That transcultural, transnational, having that as a focus sounds like a really useful way in. Yeah, because I was thinking that when I was reading uh, some of your work, Ian, that this um, not not living in a country, not speaking the language, how does that, when you're an academic, that can be really difficult. But in fact, what's it's really valuable to be able to do those comparisons and see it as a kind of holistic, global kind of thing, though, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, that's what I think is really valuable. Uh, yeah. About yeah, this thank industrially, you. yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, totally. I think that's a great point, Laura, because I think um, it's the, yeah, it's a big challenge, and it's one I'm always kind of asking myself because I, because I do work on global popular cinema, and I'm always kind of asking myself, well, what, what could I contribute that someone who uh, is a, a detail like an area specialist who has grown up in that country, who has access to all of the kind of archives and the detailed work that I can't get access to or will struggle to get access to and so it becomes the, those that kind of larger transnational comparison becomes well actually yeah there's something I can do in in bringing together this work putting the work that's going on in Turkey into dialogue with the work that's going on in Mexican cinema studies and Brazilian cinema studies and seeing if we can put together a larger picture of of these interactions between global popular mm. cinemas so in a way I'm almost like a facilitator of that work like I can't I can't be the 
um, I can't do that detailed work. And I, even though I try, like I, I've been learning Hindi for a number of years. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, slowly working towards a more detailed project on, on Indian popular cinema. But even once I get to the point where I'm fluent and that, you know, that is the goal that I'm, I'll be fluent and we'll be able to, you know, read Devanagari and, and watch the, the films without subtitles. And even then I'm not going to have that level of cultural knowledge to bring to the analysis that, that a scholar who's grown up in India and and there are scholars writing on this in India. So, yeah, it's always about finding a way of who are you as a scholar? What are the things that you can bring to a project? And one of the things I can bring is that I have obsessively studied this on a global level and, mm -hmm. and have kind of built up knowledge um, and 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 of the scholarship and of all of the of the films, and then can just identify the similarities and differences between what was going on in in Turkey in the seventies and early eighties, and what was going on in the in the Philippines in the sixties, and what's going on in in India towards the end of the decade. It sounds like there are patterns. There are kind of global patterns of uh, yeah, this sort of recycling of. American pop culture <laughs> like I don't I don't even I don't know much about this um but yeah it, do, it does sound like there are patterns there and there are really interesting cross-cultural things happening no definitely and I think part of it is to do with yeah the strength of the local industry the relationship with the kind of um the the relationship with Hollywood so for example I often find that Bollywood is is very has a very similar approach to remakes that Hollywood does which is, yeah, Hollywood will do a remake of Infernal Affairs as, as The Departed, mm -hmm. and there won't be an assumption that you're familiar with Infernal Affairs. In fact, they probably prefer that you weren't. <laughs> They're kind of doing a remake, and it's for audiences who are not interested in the, the original, who won't watch the subtitle version. And Bollywood is similar. Like The assumption is audiences in India, or the vast majority of audiences, are not watching Hollywood films. So if you do a Bollywood remake of a Hollywood film, you're you're making it for an audience who are just not familiar with that at all and and so often you're not really using the iconography you're not mm. you're not making use of the music or anything recognizable because it's really just about taking a plot and then they call it um indianizing it so it, often it's, it's adding songs or um often adding subplots and and kind of lengthening you know so that it's three hours um but whereas in turkey with these you know, with Uch of Adam, with Captain America and Santo and, and Spider-Man, you recognise those characters straight away. And the, the, the purpose of the films is, is to kind of, for audiences to recognise them. And so the, the kind of motivation behind the kind of reworking adaptation is actually much more about drawing on consumer awareness and knowledge because Hollywood has that power. Let's just capitalize mm. on that. Let's make use of that. Okay, everyone knows all of these characters from American pop culture. Well, let's do a local, you know, let's do a Turkish version of Batman. Mm. And let's let's kind of capitalize on that awareness and then, you know, locate him in Istanbul. So I think, yeah, it's often to do with the relative power of, of each industry and then the relative amount of awareness of American pop culture in mm. each country as well. I mean, that kind of brings us nicely to Turkish Star Wars, which, of mm. course, isn't really Star Wars, but Nick stuff from Star Wars to a hilarious degree. <laughs> yeah. um, I uh, I was going to ask, like, why they weren't sued. Is it just because they were too small or like it was just too sh sh with too um, S word? <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to swear on this, Adrian. <laughs> um, like, what, I mean, it's just so blatant. <laughs> I mean, it is. I think it's partly to do with it being fairly small. So not because they're not getting distribution outside of Turkey. There's a sense in which it's not a big target for for Lucasfilm to go after, and or now for Disney to go after. So I think that's part of it. But yeah, I mean, it's very blatant. It's it's using yeah footage from Star Wars and, and music from Raiders of the Lost Ark and Flash Gordon and Battlestar <laughs> Galactica and. So I think, yeah, in terms of breaking copyright law, it's very, very blatant. Is it right that there was no copyright law in Turkey at the time? So for them, they could they could get away with it because that was just how the law stood. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated because there were 
they were signed up to the Berne Convention, so so that, like there, there there was kind of international copyright law nominally on the books, but it was never really applied. Not not until Turkey was applying to join the EU many years later. So I think it's partly to do with yeah a sense in which yeah copyright law in that that kind of anglophone sense of it um, wasn't really being applied in Turkey um, and. And also, yeah, the industry in Hollywood just weren't really aware that this was happening. And often, like over time, they become aware, like by, by the 90s in Bollywood, when they're doing loads of unlicensed remakes, Hollywood studios start to come knocking and start to come and say, hang on a minute, you should be paying us you know, the, <laughs> the licensing rights for this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even I, th I think with Turkish Star Wars, I think they'd struggle to ever get licensing rights for, for what they've, they've used. Just because they're using all the, the yeah all the footage. So my understanding is I, I watched the Ed Glazer a little documentary that he's got on on YouTube, which I saw your name was in the credits mm -hmm. out of that. Um, and in there he talks about the fact that they were, it wasn't always the plan to take footage from Star Wars. That was a solution because they did actually build some proper spaceship sets, but they built them on a beach, which then a storm came in and destroyed them. So they didn't have the money to rebuild them. So that's when he took the footage uh, illegally from Star Wars. So it seemed to me that this wasn't a common practice in Turkish cinema. They weren't always just nicking footage. Music, yes, definitely. The Godfather theme theme mm. crops up all the time, but mu so but not footage. So this is, does, is this film quite unusual in that sense that it's actually incorporating Hollywood footage as well as just imagery from. Yeah, no, definitely. I would say, yeah, it is quite unique in, in that sense. And yeah, you're right. Yeah. So Chitin and Anch has talked about, you know, the kind of excuse is that, yeah, their set blew away and therefore, you know, they, they didn't have a budget to kind of replicate Hollywood special effects. And so they make use of, of the footage from Star Wars. But yeah, there's there's very few filmmakers who, who produce films for cinemas that are not just fan films that are that are using this. I mean, I guess Godfrey Ho in, in Hong Kong makes use of footage from other films, but even then, yeah, I don't think there's anything quite like uh, Turkish Star Wars in, in terms of that blatant use of... Uh, just like following on from that question, I just have to wonder, so this was what, 1982, that Turkish Star Wars came out? I think I'm getting more Scottish as I'm talking to a Scottish person, because I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> I've been in England for a long time. And suddenly there's like a Scottish person from the East Coast. Hello. Um, yeah, so anyway, 1982, Turkish Star Wars. Uh, but like actual Star Wars would have been a cultural phenomenon globally. So like Turkish audiences, would they have, have just been like really aware of Star Wars? And how would that complicate how they watch this film? <laughs> no, that's a great question. Yeah, because the, they would have been aware of, of Star Wars. Uh, so yeah, it was released in the country that they, they were, yeah. It was it was a big hit there, just as as it was everywhere else. So yeah, it's one of the things that Neze Erdogan, um, one of the Turkish scholars who's written on this, talks about, because yeah, he thinks that it, there's something quite different between this and, and other remakes, because you're you're kind of yeah, you're watching the film and you're aware that that is footage from Star Wars. It's it's not like audiences are watching it and thinking oh. Chitin and Anch's budget's gone up. Those are some, yeah, he's got some great special effects there. It's like, oh yeah, that's that's that bit from Star Wars. And like, <laughs> oh yeah, there's the Indiana Jones theme kicking in. And and so the relationship with it is is a little bit like a parody. That's often one of the debates around around these films. Like, are we are these films making fun of Hollywood and kind of um, like ripping off Hollywood and therefore using it as a form of resistance against Hollywood's power? Um, or are audiences actually laughing at the film and, and it's kind of failure to be able to emulate Hollywood? Um, like, you know, they, they don't have the budget and they don't have the ability. It's, it's, so some of the scholars have written on the Brazilian parody of Jaws. Um, talk about that because on the one hand, yeah, it's a Brazilian parody of Jaws. You, you could totally make a kind of progressive, kind of resistant argument saying, yeah, they're taking the power of Hollywood and using it in, as a form of jujitsu against the domination and, and kind of they're able to kind of rip off those elements, use them to their own purposes, use them again. But ultimately, audiences are laughing at 
the bad special effects and the bad mm. um, attempt to do a, a Brazilian version of, of Jaws. And I think it's quite similar with this with Turkish Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, they seem to be taking it very seriously. They don't seem to be trying to make a comedy with this one. Yeah, no, I think that's true. Yeah, and it, it's diff there are different ones. I mean, the Turkish Star Trek, so it's the Tourist Omer series, that one is a bit more of a... Mm. of a kind of self-conscious parody of, of Star Trek. Yeah, it's about like a, Turkish, the, a Turkish holiday maker who ends up on the Enterprise or something like that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So the character <laughs> Turistomar, so in his first film, he's a kind of rural kind of um, character who goes into Istanbul. And so it's a kind of fish out of water kind of mm. story mm. Um, where like, oh, he, he's a guy from the kind of rural village and he doesn't really get what they're doing in Istanbul. And, and then as the series progresses, he goes to different countries and and he's like, oh, now he's in Spain and he meets matadors and there's bullfighting and he gets caught up in that and he doesn't really understand what they're doing. Uh, and then it, I mean, it gets, uh, I think problematic is the best word for the uh, tourist homer in Africa, because mm -hmm. the, the title translates as tourist homer among the cannibals. And so, yeah, that film... Yeah we, yeah, we write that one out of the, the history. The word problematic comes up on this podcast fairly often, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. And then, As um, you can imagine, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but yeah, then they, they end up, yeah, I think it's the, the seventh one. He ends up, yeah, transported onto the Enterprise and they recreate one of the episodes from the original series, the, the Man Trap episode. Mm. Um, so you've got Kirk and Spock and Doc McCoy and, and all the rest. Um, and the the salt sucking monster from that episode, but then you've got this Turkish character inserted into the narrative, who's kind of poking fun at Spock and making fun <laughs> of the his ears. And... <laughs> so it's it's got that kind of it's much more of a of a parody that is it could be read as a kind of comment on and resistance towards Hollywood. Is there like a Turkish Doctor Who? Um. I've not actually, yeah, I don't, not that I'm aware of. I mean, there's lots of more recent kind of Turkish TV that is riffing off American and British shows. But yeah, I can't think of a Turkish. I oh, remember a, seeing, I just remember seeing one, but I couldn't remember if it was a parody of Turkish parodies of mm. uh, like <laughs> Western, oh. like Hollywood and British shows, or if it was an actual, actual Turkish version <laughs> i just can't remember so there is, there is a kind of comedy sequel to um the man who saved the world which was just came out oh yeah within the last 10 years or so i saw so is this something that turkey has become kind of self-aware of now that they're making these films as comedies looking back on what they did 40 years ago or is there still a kind of more serious remake culture going on that you're aware of no it's, yeah it's a good question because in a lot of ways, the yeah that film, the the son of the man who saves the world, the sequel, is is really terrible and not in a good way. Like it, <laughs> like so, the man who saves the world, the, the Turkish Star Wars, is often talked about as being, you know, Turkey's equivalent of Plan Nine from Outer Space, like one of the, it's like Turkey's entry uh, as mm. one of the best so bad it's good films ever made. Mm. But the problem with then doing a film. You know, all these decades later that is kind of a sequel is that they're then in on the joke so they're trying to make something bad but at the same time they're trying to make something that with updated special effects and, and like is a deliberate comedy um and it just fails on all levels it's 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 not yeah like all the fans of the original hate it anyone anyone who liked some of the recent turkish sci-fi films from the 2000s films like gora also hate it like it so I think it's that problem that that filmmakers who do a kind of so bad it's good film you know like when they did the sequel to Samurai Cop or something like that where it's like okay here's a film that was unintentionally bad and now we're going to do a sequel trying to capitalize on the fact that everyone loved how bad it was mm -hmm. and are they now going to ruin it by being by having a kind of deliberate camp rather than naive camp uh, and yeah and almost always they do ruin it mm -hmm. uh, but yeah in Turkey there are there are there are remakes still going on copyright means that they're not quite as blatant as as the man who saves the world but yeah there's lots in because Turkish TV is 
like a global phenomenon just now and and is really successful on, on Netflix and, and all over so I think um yeah it that's where it is it, it's those kind of like TV format adaptations um where this kind of cross-cultural adaptation is still continuing I couldn't tell if um the man who saved the world was in on the joke or not because I watched the version on the internet archive without English subtitles I was I very confused ouch you made life <laughs> you made life even more difficult for yourself there I kind of wanted to um, yeah, no, that, that's, that's like the yeah I think the original time when I watched it would have been like that like a kind of yeah, like a DVD-R copy with no subtitles. It's probably oh, yeah. the same version on the Internet Archive. <laughs> like, there, there's a YouTube version with subtitles that I did watch based off. So I kind of, yeah, was, like, aware of the plot. But the first time around, I was just, I was kind of fascinated by how, I just, it did seem like a parody. It seemed mm. like they were on the joke. A lot of it seemed deliberate. And I'm not sure if it was the copy I watched, but, you know, the Death Star looked like an egg. It, it was. was just, like, squeezed. I don't know if that was yeah. in the original. Yeah. <laughs> Like the way that they sort of reuse this material, it just seems kind of, um, I read it as parodic. Mm. Uh, I didn't know if I was supposed to or not. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a difficult one because there, there's some parts of the film which are definitely very ridiculous. And yeah, it's difficult to read it as being serious. I think it. people often talk about it, if you treat it like a kid's film, so it's it's deliberately silly rather than necessarily parodic if that makes sense like mm. it, like they've it, they've got a ridiculous golden sword that they're fighting oh, with which is amazing is, that sword yeah <laughs> so it's, it's not meant to look convincing or to look like that this is a convincing battle sequence it's meant to look fun and over the top and fantastical and, and a bit ridiculous and the, and the big um furry kind of monster kind of um yeah. costumes oh, like the, yeah this isn't a serious kind of sci-fi film um but on the oh, same, I, no, yeah, yeah I, I didn't think it yeah in any in any context it could be taken that way you know when i watched i watched a few years ago the turkish wizard of oz mm. um and that was without subtitles so but we know the story the wizard of oz so that's fine i can follow that and we we sort of laughed along but i did wonder again coming back to this word problematic should i have been laughing like should I be comfortable am I laughing at somebody else's cultural you know output because of my own ignorance of what they're trying to do like we, we could laugh at the man who saves the world but then all of a sudden there's a whole section where they go into a church and it all gets very serious and religious and they talk about Islam and all of a sudden you're like oh hang on am I I probably shouldn't be laughing at this now am I being horribly culturally insensitive by finding this funny um i mean that and that kind i don't know bringing what, what we bring to it from a sort of western cultural perspective that must be something you come up against all the time in the films that you look at like is Definitely. it okay is it okay to laugh at something just because you you know they might have been doing it very seriously and, and i don't know how do you resolve that no it, yeah i think that is a it's definitely an issue that comes up and and often sometimes the screening context can change it because as you say yeah if you're watching without subtitles or the bad, bad copy there, there's a kind of particular way of watching it and for a long time the the Turkish Exorcist um so Shaitan which basically it's almost shot for shot remake of the Exorcist except the um, Catholicism's replaced with Islam so iconography shifts and, mm. and some of the characters change a little bit but it's fairly fairly close um and I've I've watched it in the version that used to circulate online, um, and I think you can still find online with like really badly translated subtitles, and the copy is really bad, so the special effects look particularly terrible. And then recently, we've done well, uh, Fanatic Film in Turkey have done a, an HD restoration of the film, and then we've sorted out the subtitles for the the screening. And when I've done screenings in in London, one of the the bits of feedback I got was that they couldn't laugh at the film but all of a sudden it was like actually this this is quite a well-made remake of exorcist hmm. and and doesn't it doesn't give that same so bad it's good pleasure that they had anticipated or and or that they had got with the turkish star wars so i think yeah sometimes when these films are, are kind of treated well and are restored and and 
you know you can actually see a, a, a good translation in the subtitles and they're they're treated with respect i think some of that the kind of laughter at the film uh, dissipates a little bit um but yeah no it's something i'm always coming up across in, in my research like uh I did a chapter on Weng Weng. So, so this is in the Philippines, the James Bond spoofs. So, um, so he's a three foot tall actor. So he was in the film uh, For Your Height Only. And it had become a kind of cult film because of that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I was kind of grappling with exactly that issue. It, it, the problem of um, what is our relationship to this as an audience? Are we laughing at him? And um, because of you know his size, of his his ethnicity, like he's trying to be Bond, and he's very obviously not able to be Bond, and so there's kind of seduction scenes and action scenes where the joke is is just laughing at him, and yet there's a fandom who love him and mm. and are kind of you know have t-shirts of him. Andrew Leval did a whole documentary devoted yeah. to him. In search for Wang Wang. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And and it kind of, so it starts from a position that might be, yeah, again, problematic, um, but then, you know, develops into Andrew Leval spends decades of his life learning Tagalog, going, you know, spending years interviewing all of the actors and directors and producers that Wang Wang worked with, treating him and his career with more attention and respect than, than anyone has done, mm -hmm. devoting a whole documentary to, to him. Um, so it's trying to kind of work through those problems. I sometimes talk about it as uh, cult cosmopolitanism. So it's got all of the kind of problematic aspects of cult when it's got that kind of openness to other cultures. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it has that potential to lead towards a kind of deeper understanding of international popular culture. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, I think it is a problem, and it's a problem with you know the hand painted Ghanaian film posters. It's a problem with yeah, for your height only. It's a problem with Turkish Star Wars. Surely it should be for your size only, and so like for your height only, for your size yeah. only. Is it that's, like that's translation another, thing? That's another level of brilliant though. With that, isn't there something else to laugh at? <laughs> That's it, yeah. And so, yeah, bad translation is often a, a big part of, of mm -hmm. these things. So bad subtitles is a whole genre. Like people, it, it's like people sharing bad uh, translations on signs. In, mm. in you know, like here's a sign in China that that says what to do in this bathroom, but actually the the mm -hmm. language doesn't make sense. Are there like fan communities that? Because I know with stuff like K-drama and things that go international where there isn't a distribution, um, fans get together and subtitle from different countries online. They will subtitle um, like, you know, a particular television show that they want to watch in English or in um, Czech or, you know, as, as any other language. Uh, do they, is there a kind of like fan community culture with that, with these kinds of kind of remakes? Do people just kind of get together and subtitle them just because they're fans and they want to be able to watch it in their language? No, definitely. Yeah. And that is a big part of it. And in fact, I think I wouldn't have been able to do my PhD, you know, as much as I was trying to learn languages and become, you know, multilingual, uh, you know, I, I wasn't getting much beyond counting to 10 and asking people uh, the way to the supermarket. So like, yeah, I, I was never quite going to quite get to the point where I could translate all the films myself. Um, but yeah, there are fan communities that have been doing fan subbing um, through, there's like BitTorrent communities as part of it and just these kind of online groups where there'll be kind of incentives for people to do a translation of, of this film. We all want this particular one translated and then mm -hmm. Other people will do the work of, of doing the sub, subtitles. So the, yeah, the, I think the, yeah, the musical uh, alias Batman and Robin was one where, yeah, I got some money from Nottingham at the time, was able to use that to pay someone to translate it. And then mm. I did the, the subtitles and then shared that with the, the community. So yeah, mm. there's definitely that kind of fan community where everyone brings in the skills and time and expertise that they have just to kind of make sure, yeah, one, that you've got the best quality version of this film, then you've got accurate subtitles that are properly matched up. 
And then more recently, yeah, now you've got companies like Fanatic in Turkey who are doing HD restorations of some of the films, but they're doing it without subtitles. So then, mm. of course, those the kind of fan subbing communities then kind of come together and make sure that there are proper English subtitles for all of these releases as well. Cool. Amazing. Yeah, you're um, you're doing great work <laughs> in bringing well, all these things together. It's it's that thing where because I think there is often a little voice in my head, as you're saying, like, is it problematic to be watching these films, you know, writing about them, like um, screening them even? Because there is that sense of like, oh, yeah, here's another funny, weird film from around the world. Mm. Uh, let's laugh at how weird and bizarre it is because of cultural differences or mistranslation or its use of elements that we recognize from Hollywood. But with bad costumes or it's music from another film that makes it kind of incongruous. Um, so there's then, I feel like, a, an added kind of responsibility to try and, yeah, take them seriously mm -hmm. and to, and to yeah, to do these restorations, to get the best subtitles we can get, the best HD quality we can get. And, and then when we do screenings, to have... Um, Turkish academics come and, and give do Q and A's or or people that are involved with the films like we had uh, Chetin Inanch's niece uh, who's actually a, a really famous successful uh, journalist in in Turkey uh, she she happened to be over in London when we were doing the screening so she came and gave a Q and A talking about um, her uncle and um, yeah I think there's that sense of yeah a kind of a need to to be careful with these films mm. and, and to treat them with with some level of respect and i think uh, what yeah what you're doing and other people are doing it you're putting the sort of context around these things like i found watching the documentary um remake remix is it remix remake ripoff that's it yeah it's one of those um I, I developed a you know, having just because you can just watch the turkish films and just think oh yeah look how poorly made these are and whatever but then you watch something like that and you see how hard they were working and the conditions they were working under. But there's a brilliant bit in the documentary where you see how they did tracking shots, where they build this kind of wooden contraption and then they nail bars of soap to the legs and then they pour water and then they can just kind of push it along and it gives this gliding shot. It's brilliant. And I do, you, when you see how they how primitive their, I, perhaps that's not the right word, but how good a basic their equipment was, the time constraints, financial constraints, political constraints. The fact that they were making all of these films, just churning them out, new films every week, is kind of amazing. I think that yeah. does help you to, knowing how hard they were working means that you can't just point and laugh. You know, you've got to respect what they were doing, even with something as ridiculous as The Man Who Saved the World. They worked really hard to make that thing. Mm. And I think you can sort of develop a respect for that whilst also occasionally laughing well just that yeah there's a kind of ingenuity to what the, the kind of the way that they're solving mm. all of these problems and mm. that's part of the reason i love jem kaya's documentary because you could do a documentary on this that was just clips of all of these films mm -hmm. and people would be perfectly happy they'd be like oh yeah there's a turkish some like some like it hot oh here's a funny clip of of that variation here's the turkish death wish oh yeah that's interesting here's here's star trek and spock and yep yeah, that's funny and you, you could you could pass a, a documentary with that um but he actually yeah took it really seriously interviewed everyone involved with the whole industry and just creates a really kind of touching portrait of all of these struggling filmmakers who know they're not making masterpieces and are, are working under conditions in which that would never be possible, but are just coming up with really kind of ingenious solutions to that problem. And, and I think Turkish Star Wars, The Man Who Saves the World is a great example of that because like, yeah, it has a tiny budget. It's got, you know, cheesy costumes and, and ridiculous sword fighting and all the rest. And, and is using footage from Star Wars and music from Flash Gordon and, and all the rest. But it's it's just really entertaining to watch. Like mm -hmm. it is a really propulsive, like every time I've done a screening of that film with, with the proper you know, 2K restoration and, and the proper subtitles, like it gets a standing ovation. Like mm -hmm. audiences love watching it. 
it is, mm. it is definitely the most kind of entertaining from start to finish of, of any of these of these remakes. Mm. Um, and it is, it's, 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 it's kind of, there is an admiration for what Inanch managed to achieve despite all of the things that he was struggling with. Yeah, absolutely. I love the bit when he's punching the aliens' heads off <laughs> in those costumes. They're brilliant. It's like somebody's going mad on the set of Sesame Street. It's, uh, <laughs> it's quite, quite something. Um, okay, well, thank you, Ian. Thanks so much for taking the time to come on. And, thank you very and, much, Ian. That was well really as... fascinating. No, thank it's opened you. my mind to a whole new kind of mode of filmmaking and mm. international distribution. It's very cool. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Know, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Okay, so thank you again to Ian for coming on and uh, clearing some things up for us and explaining why films like this matter. I think one of the things that I'm enjoying about doing this podcast is finding films um, and that are quite forgettable <laughs> or perhaps should be forgotten. Um, but then, but discovering why they why they matter, why they're still important. A bit like something like Smashing Time, which is which we did last time, you know, which has been neglected and forgotten, but actually it's super interesting. can be considered to be, yeah, there's quite a lot of important things to say about it. So, yeah, thank you, Ian, for uh, for helping us to get our heads around Turkish style. And me particularly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and for inspiring Laura to go back and, and watch and the really whole film. And really closely analyse specific scenes. From beginning yeah. to end, yeah. <laughs> Re pausing, rewinding, uh -huh. all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably it. So uh, we haven't really decided what we're going to do next. So just keep an eye on our Twitter. And if you have suggestions, feel free yeah. to let us know. Please do. If you want to come on and talk about your research with us, then we are definitely open to that as well. Mm -hmm, definitely. So, um, yeah. So you find us on Twitter at what are we called? At Second Features. Uh -huh. Uh, and uh, you can email us. We are on what are we called there? Second features pod at gmail.com. So we would love to hear from you if you have any feedback. Leave us a review as well. I haven't actually looked for ages. I don't know if anyone's left us any reviews, but if you want to leave us reviews on your podcast app, um, that that's would be really cool. Helpful. Yeah. Would, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, and go out and buy I Don't Want to Be Born and tell all your friends. Cool. I don't know. All right. I think that's probably, another, another, that's probably enough. Another um, suave ending. Ah, yeah, super, uh, yeah. <laughs> too, too, too much self promotion for one episode. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, we should, we should plug, plug the interesting stuff that we've done, yeah. especially this past month. Yeah, it's been fun. Right. Thank you, Laura. It's been uh, good to do this again. And thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>